Well, let's get into the day's top stories. And joining me now is Shadow Spokesman for Home Affairs and Cybersecurity, Senator James Patterson. James, thanks so much for your time. Intelligence agencies are on high alert to prevent violent attacks from happening here at home after an Australian man with links to Hezbollah was killed in Lebanon. James, national security experts warn it's likely more Australians will go overseas to fight in terror groups as this conflict in the Middle East intensifies. How concerning should this be? It's great to be with you, Caroline, and let me start by saying that was a very powerful editorial and thank you for reminding us what happened on the 7th of October and for bringing that New York Times report to the attention of your viewers. It's very important that all Australians never forget what happened and that Hamas promises to repeat those atrocities again and again and again. Uh, like you, I'm very concerned by the inability of the Albanese government to answer very basic, straightforward questions uh, about these uh, brothers who are deceased uh, in southern Lebanon, and one of, at least one of whom has strong links uh, to Hezbollah, a listed terrorist organisation in Australia. The Attorney General, uh, Mark Dreyfus, wasn't able to shed any light on that yesterday, and that Home Affairs statement you just read out uh, shed no further light on it. It is of concern to me that at least one Australian has left our country to go and fight with Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and I think those concerns that others hold that more may travel are very well founded because we know that during the period of the Islamic Caliphate, uh, so-called ISIS, uh, that many Australians went and all sought to go to fight with that organisation. And the previous government went to great lengths to try and stop them from doing so, frankly, for their own sake, so they didn't get themselves killed. And because it was a very dangerous training ground for terrorists, that we didn't want to go and get equipped with skills to come back and threaten our community. At the moment, based on the response from the Missing in Action uh, Minister for Home Affairs, I have no confidence that the Albanese government is on top of this issue and is dealing with this issue adequately. Well, Senator, you did say yesterday, following that um, press conference by uh, the Attorney General, Mark Dreyfus, that, you know, you wanted the government to... You want to make sure the government is transparent with, with Australians over this issue. Um, as, we, as we both talked about, it has remained tight-lipped. You saw that department response that you referred to. Um, and we have no more information from the government today about this. I mean, how confident are you that we are going to get to the bottom of how much the government knows? And do Australians deserve more transparency? I think the bare minimum that the Australian public is entitled to is transparency from the Albanese government when it comes to this matter, these matters, particularly because we know their handling of national security more broadly has been inept and weak. We saw that in response to the High Court ruling on immigration detention. We've seen that in relation to deployment of naval uh, forces uh, in the Red Sea, in relation to uh, the Houthi terrorism that's in, being engaged there. We've seen it on a whole range of fronts. They're slow, they're weak, and they often don't know what they're doing. And so I think Australians will be legitimately concerned that there may be other Australians who are in Lebanon on fighting with Hezbollah, that there may be some here who intend to go and travel, or that there may be radical elements supportive of Hezbollah here in Australia. Now, let's remember that Hezbollah in its entirety is listed as a terrorist organisation. It is a crime to associate with them, to aid them, to fundraise for them, to fight for them. And it has been the Australian government's very clear travel advice for more than two months now that you should not travel to, to Lebanon, in particular not to southern Lebanon, and a region of conflict with the IDF uh, from, but with uh, Hezbollah. And so why was an Australian citizen allowed to travel to that region and someone who was a brother of someone who appears to be a Hezbollah fighter who was just buried with full military honours? I mean, there are many questions to, uh, to answer about this, but there's no one from the Albanese government who seems able to do that. Yeah, there are so many questions, you're right. And we'll come back to what you're saying about the Houthi rebels uh, in a little bit. But I want to ask you um, more about Hezbollah and the Sydney connections, because we are aware, uh, rather the Australian connections, because it's not just here, um, but we are aware of a growing number of commemoration services for Hezbollah terrorists who have died overseas in the conflict. There was one just last night at a South Sydney mosque that I revealed here on the show this week week. Do you think the government needs to be treating these kinds of events more seriously or are they hamstrung by the laws that we have in place? 
They shouldn't be hamstrung by our laws at all because the law is very clear. Under the criminal code associating with, which includes fundraising for, recruiting for or fighting for a terrorist organisation like Hezbollah or Hamas or any of the others, is a criminal offence and very serious criminal penalties are attached to it. It's my hope that the federal police and our security agencies are working very closely with their state counterparts and keeping a very close eye on these so-called uh, vigils or commemorations for deceased terrorists in the Middle East. Uh, it's disturbing to me that anyone will want to celebrate the life of a terrorist. Uh, it's disturbing to me that that would happen here in Australia. And anyone who thinks that that is an opportunity to recruit for uh, or to raise support for a terrorist organisation should be on notice that they could be committing a very serious offence for which there'll be very serious penalties. But we have seen earlier in this conflict some of the initial marches that, uh, for example, uh, portraits of Hassan Nasrallah, uh, the Secretary General of Hezbollah, were being proudly displayed at some of the earlier pro-Palestinian uh, protests after October 7. So I really hope that the federal government has these, this in hand and that those people in our community who are supportive of Hezbollah are under very close and tight watch. Yeah, it's incredible how brazen some of those protesters can be with the flags that you mentioned. And I, I do think, though, that there seems to be a loophole in the federal laws, at least, um, in terms of funerals uh, when it comes to associating with terrorists. So I don't know if that needs to be addressed. But I want to move on now to the Red Sea operation. Opposition leader Peter Dutton today slammed Labor's decision not to send a warship to the region as weak and incompetent. It comes as the Iran-backed Houthi rebels continue to target vessels in the Red Sea. Senator, what do you make of Mr Albanese's choice to focus on its Indo-Pacific strategy over a US-led mission? Well, Australians are paying the price for Anthony Albanese's weak leadership on national security. Australia has a very strong interest in reopening the Red Sea for safe passage for commercial vessels because we are a trading nation and we are a nation in which the vast majority of our international trade is seaborne and very significant commodities pass through the Suez Canal and then the Red Sea to Australia, including oil and other commodities. And so Australians are going to be paying higher prices at the Bowser because the Prime Minister didn't have the courage or the ability to contribute to a multi multinational force with our closest allies, including the United States and the United Kingdom, to gain control again of the Red Sea and to remove the terrorist threat from the Houthis uh, that are being posed to commercial shipping vessels. And those price increases will flow on to supermarkets and other places as well. And ultimately, Australians who are already struggling enough with the cost of living are going to be paying more because this government has been too weak and too uh, and, and unable to contribute to this very important multinational mission. Moving on to other big news this week. It's, it seems like no company is safe from cyber attacks at the moment. We learned Yakult Australia is the latest target. Ransomware group Dragonforce claims it has stolen 95 gigabytes worth of data, including sensitive employee information. James, how concerned should we be about these attacks? Well, once again, we have a Minister for Home Affairs and Cyber Security who's missing in action. We have an acting cyber security minister who's dealing with this matter and an acting national coordinator on cyber security who are dealing with this matter because this government is obviously unable to field people in their full-time roles with their core responsibilities of dealing with these crises. And whether it's St Vincent's or Yukult, I'm very concerned about these repeated attacks and the inability of the Albanese government to get to the bottom of them. In the case of St Vincent's, it's more than 10 days now and we still don't know whether or not any patient data has been stolen, who has stolen it, what they intend to do with it, um, or what data has been lost. And that is just um, utterly incompetent from this government and unfortunately reflects the lack of seriousness that they bring to the issues of national security. And I think Australians are entitled to be concerned about what is happening in this space because cyber criminals are out there roaming and not being met with the full force of the federal government to protect us. It, it seems like only a matter of time but before every individual is affected. I got an email myself today from uh, my local library saying the local council's library had been cyber, uh, attacked in a cyber attack. It's just extraordinary. But finally, I do want to ask you about Australia's privacy watchdog launching an inquiry into TikTok to investigate whether the Chinese-owned app is harvesting users' data without their consent. Senator, I know you're no fan of TikTok. Uh, are you happy that this probe has been launched? 
It, it's overdue, Caroline, but it's very welcome. It was more than a year ago that I first wrote to the Privacy Commissioner and said that they should investigate TikTok for breaches of Australians' privacy, and now they've finally agreed to do so. In response to these latest very serious allegations, which involved them using a marketing tool, a piece of software called a Pixel, embedded on companies' websites that collects the information of everybody who visits that website, whether they're a TikTok user or not. And that information can include things like your email address, your phone number, your browsing history and your shopping habits. And in critically, the allegations are that TikTok is collecting this information without the consent of those users. Now, if that is the case, if that's proven to be the case, then they will have violated Australia's privacy laws and should be up for some very serious fines and penalties. But that it shouldn't stop there because we know that TikTok is a recalcitrant company. They are a repeat offender when it comes to things like this. And frankly, we need legislation to deal with it. And the Albanese government and the Minister for Home Affairs and Cybersecurity, Claire O'Neill, has been sitting on not one, but two reports in the last six months which recommend action to tackle TikTok, and she's done nothing to deal with it. And I think that that is well overdue for action. It's far from an innocent uh, dance choreography platform, is it? Uh, Senator James Patterson, thank you so much for your time this evening.